microphones on. We're being asked to put our microphones on. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, I didn't think about identity. I just thought very selfishly, let's create an ensemble. You just you first create something. Uh, in my case, but just um, I was a member of the World Youth Choir, an ensemble that has an identity, um, and I realized I was getting old, and there are people I would not be able to work with. And um, during a winter session, that was a, a project when you had, you had less singers, a very international group, we sang a piece by Scarlatti for 10 voices, but 36 people. And I was just like, I would like to sing it with one person apart, so only 10 people. And I would have to wait years and years to do it. So I would just create my own ensemble to do it once. And here I am 18 years later. <laughs> With a, with a single project, I wanted to do something once a year. I'm now spending my whole life for this group. Um, and the first time I, I will be, I will try to be short. First time I start in thinking about identity is when you have to sell your ensemble. Because quite quickly you have to sell it to find concerts. And this was in the world of choral music. Um, um, a meeting that was called Polyfolia. I don't know if anybody yes. of you has, yeah. has got... It was called the, the, the Market of Choral Music. And it was very funny because you would be there with a gospel choir, a jazz band. It was Touche from Denmark. I even remember the name. There was a Club for Five from... Uh, mm. So like five on the microphone. And we were the kind of weird early music ensemble and each of us had to meet 100 uh, mm -hmm. promoters and we had to tell what was our identity. And it was too early. That was one year and a half after we were created and I realized we didn't have one. We don't have one, yeah. Then we spent years building one, but I will give the... No, it's interesting. We'll come back to that. Where yeah. is that moment that you have to start answering that, that question for you know, a new ensemble? Looking at the history, you have this wonderful history mm -hmm. of Perpetuum... Uh, Jazzily, you know, they, you, you started life as the Gaudiamus Chamber Choir exactly. in 83. Three. Now, can you just talk us through the, uh, the, the the career of the ensemble where suddenly now it's one of the most sought after show choirs uh, in the world, as far as I can see. What what happened? Actually, uh, it, oh, Shan, yeah. you, yes, thank you. Um, the choir was established by, by, by a guy called Marco Tiran. Um, he uh, actually informally uh, established this already a few years late, uh, earlier, but in 83 is like an official beginning. Uh, but it started actually as a spin-off from a very renowned classical uh, choir uh, in Slovenia. Uh, its name still is uh, APZ Tone Tomšić. <laughs> and um, what Marko wanted to create is uh, a rhythmic choir that would focus on a cappella music. Uh, uh, so um, jazzy stuff, uh, contemporary stuff in terms of uh, the popular, popular genre. Um, and uh, he couldn't do that within that classical choir he was part of before, and he established a, a new one. So they started to, to work on, uh, on rhythmic music, he started to write arrangements and uh, gathered people around and uh, the, the choir grew. Um, I joined the group uh, 17 years later uh, in, uh, in 96, as a, as, a singer. as a singer, as a second tenor in 96. Um, after I, I stumbled upon this choir by accident, hearing them rehearse um, and being stupid at that time and fun, being a fundamentalist instrumentalist, I could not believe my ears that attractive music can be done by singing. So, <laughs> and then I joined, <laughs> and my world turned around. And you've, paid, you've been paying the price ever since. Yes, I've been paying the price ever since. Um, but when did, when did this question of, I always just assume identity is a moment of epiphany, when yeah. you know what you are yeah, and yeah. what you want to communicate. Can, can you remember that happening? 
Yeah, um, I remember that. Uh, but just continuing from my beginnings, I started as second tenor, two, two years uh, being thrown into the group with a huge potential and huge uniqueness in the, in, in, in the area. Uh, in Slovenia, we, we are very uh, um, rich in choral terms. We have like, I don't know, 1,500 choirs, but none of them was, sorry, streaming, <laughs> none, none of them was uh, uh, focusing on rhythmic music, on singing rhythmic music only. So that was a very strong initial uh, identity um, aspect of the group. Um, I got soon involved in, in becoming an, uh, an executive board member and we started thinking how can we propel this group out to the world because it was something special. Um, in, in a way it was sort of easy because the environment was sort of pushy against us, you know, it's, well, oh, that's not the serious music, it's not serious, yeah, they're like, uh, you know, clowns or something, yeah, but, uh, you know, the group always fought with its own creativity, with its own um, uh, artistic identity, with uh, high-class singing, um, our idols were, you know, uh, groups from the Le Double Six, the Two High Lows, and Gene Perling, and Singers Unlimited, and stuff. Swingle singers, of course. Um, but we 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 made that on a bigger scale on stage, right? Um, we started from that. So uh, we just took, of course, after so many years, this concept was already internalized into the singers mindsets and bodies i would say uh, and it was quite easy to take that create products start creating products out of that and just placing them to the uh, to the outer world so and then the, and then the phone starts to ring and then and then the, <laughs> the, the perpetuum mobile yeah. started yeah, to run yeah, yeah. yeah. okay interesting yeah. there's a number of points that i want to pick up on later yeah. donna i can't imagine that an ensemble like Zoe Gospel Choir could ever begin without being almost founded on identity because no. of the great tradition. I mean, no, no. I would be surprised if you even, <laughs> surprised if you even it's, it started, think about this. No, it started uh, really differently. Uh, we uh, were responsible for programming uh, uh, the Gospel Festival in Amsterdam, and we also had a choir program. And I was looking for searching for choirs and to me all the gospel choirs in the Netherlands were all the same but I didn't think they were looking like the gospel choirs in the United States where gospel was founded so we were thinking and we were uh, my colleague and I were saying to each other it's it's not what we are looking for so but we know a lot of great singers youngsters in churches singing gospel let us just form a choir for one time, only for that show. A project choir. Project choir. Uh, my sister, who is a professional singer, also gospel, she, she did it 25 years ago. So I asked her, um, would you guide, you know, the choir in just for four weeks and to, yeah, practicing the songs with them? We created a band, so we did everything from scratch. But what we strongly knew was we didn't want like the sister act gospel choir, what is known in the Netherlands, the big robes, you know, all of that. So if you talk about identity, uh, we strongly believe that's not what we want right. to. So I'm wrong. <laughs> I'm, for us, I'm wrong. Not, not wrong or right, but just something else, something what wasn't seen in the Netherlands. So we also decided we're not going to wear the robes. Because the ropes, it, it's, it comes from somewhere. It's really sacred. It's not a gimmick or something. And uh, yes, so we, we did. We had all those great young singers and everybody was saying, yeah, just join the group, join the group. So gospel choir was like not the original name. We thought, okay, we will find a new name later on. <laughs> and it stayed that way. 
Zo is van Zuidoost, Amsterdam Zuidoost. Gospel, yeah, we sing gospel. And choir is obvious. We are a choir. But we were always thinking, oh, we're going to change the name when the show starts, but it never changed. After the show, we got the famous call because it was for one time. Would you like to uh, join a song contest? And I was really against it because I didn't really like the song contest. But to make a, short, a story short, we joined after, I think, five weeks. And we also won, won the contest. And then the first phone call came in. And if you say we were thinking about identity, what we wanted to create was like, everybody is welcome. We have one main thing, the love for singing gospel. So if you, uh, no matter what, what kind of gender, the color of your skin, ages, everybody is welcome in our choir. So if you say identity. But these are quite important departures, aren't they, from what we tend to think about gospel. I mean, if I, if I understand yeah. you correctly, you were, you, were, you were actually giving out quite a big message, which is that you were some distance from worship. From not the, really, the not really. We, we, no, no, no. Uh, we, we do like, uh, it's, it depends on uh, for what kind of public you are yeah. singing. So, so we, we sing everything. And we also sing songs with God, Jesus, but we also do popular songs. But for us, it was like more, where does it come from? It comes from the cotton fields in the USA. It comes from being um, uh, like um, secured. It comes from pain. It comes from heart. But we, the first thing we taught was everybody is welcome in this choir. There are no boundaries. That's if you call if you would call that an identity. That's what we were uh, we aimed for, and um, uh, I think the, the the best compliment we got. Oh, you are a choir of the world because you see every everybody like from Suriname, from Africa, from the Netherlands. Yeah. Everybody is in our yeah. <laughs> yes. And just briefly, um, the everyone's welcome the choir were yeah. you also uh, in your identity looking for a particular audience or no no, no. we sing everything yeah that's that's not how we started no. <laughs> that's that's so if you talk, talk identity you also have to talk about branding because the branding came afterwards which we will definitely do <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> Lionel, just let's go back to that moment when you were presenting uh Oxy Luminous for the, for the, actually for the first time probably, you were, you were sitting behind a microphone and saying, well, who are you guys and what do you do? And you think, oh, we don't have an identity. What did you do then? Um, we fighted. <laughs> because there was no clear leader. Um, I started inviting actually a conductor uh, to do the, the first project. Oh. And then for the second one, uh, so the creator of uh, Polyfolia, Jacques Van Erle, who is gone now, uh, he died some years ago now, um, asked, I want the singers to come, but without the conductor. Yes or no, you have two hours to decide. That's about taking decision. That's something that becomes important. And he said, you created the ensemble, you decide. I said, yes, after two glasses of wine um, to help. And then he said, you need a coach. I said, okay, we'll get a coach. The coach canceled uh, three weeks before the residency. So we happen to start rehearsing without anybody. This is how the whole story of working without a conductor, without a coach started. It was just an event, which we thought was a catastrophe and was a blessing. But it was a liberation. No, no. And, and so this happened actually when we were asked, what are you? So we didn't know. And we discovered by working, we liked it. When the coach came, the replacement one, we were frustrated. So we said, OK, let's spend one week with him. And then uh, <laughs> even himself, he said, I think I'm one too many. Too many so I'm not going to be there next year when we were reinvited for the same festival. And then we were starting yeah, to think. And um, we wanted to do what we call this democratic ensemble, which is everything but democratic. Let me explain what it is. A democracy elects leader 
etc., so that everybody can have a say by the vote, by everything. If you don't have any hierarchy or anything, it's anarchy. It's not democracy. And this is what we learned. So uh, <laughs> what we were telling our identity, we say, oh, we are a democratic ensemble. No, we were just an anarchy. And sometimes we're going on stage, not even agreeing on what we were going to do. Yeah. And so we, we, That's fun. we tried yeah. other, um, other um, coach. And then I tried once or twice, because they say, you created the ensemble. And after the second concert in Croatia, 2007, they said, you are the leader now, artistic leader. And then I started building, I wouldn't say an identity, but I started to build the ensemble to say, this repertoire, Bach motets, for example, this is too early, we should stop doing this. We stopped it for 10 years, for example. And, and I started to shape finding repertoire. Um, I would say how our identity came was first with repertoire, which is when the audience comes the most and when you get the biggest prize for your CDs. In our case, we got a gramophone recording of the year all over every category, etc., which is the Oscar of, the of classical one. music for Heinrich Schütz. Yeah. So then we were like, okay, we are the, the specialist for Heinrich Schütz. It's, you can't tour 70 concerts a year, Heinrich Schütz in the whole world. But so you find your niche, but more and more, it's also the way we were performing that became um, our identity. Meaning conductor less. Is that what you're saying? If, if, if I were to pin you down and say what is the absolute core of your identity, it's not repertoire, it's not uh, the fact that there's no conductor. No, it's the sound. It's the sound. I would say the sound. That's what a lot of people say. I think you get really an identity when people can identify you more than you identifying yourself. Does that mean something? What I just said. When people can really. I, yeah, and one thing I had in mind that I don't know if you can call it branding on it. I, I said, I would like that when people play a CD, they listen to the first track, they can say it's us. It's Vox Luminis. And I guess that's the sound, then that is our identity. When you play a CD, you don't know if there is a conductor or not. You know the repertoire, yes, but other people do the repertoire. So I guess the sound. When you come to a concert, then the way we perform becomes more important. You could say that about Grand de la Bois. Yes. Sure. You would know immediately that, by the way, that's an ensemble that does have a leader, but they spend as much time talking as they do rehearsing. Yeah. Could you say, could you, would you notice the difference between uh, your CD and Huelgas? Uh, yes, and Huelgas is one that I recognize immediately. Yeah. You recognize the sound of Huelgas. I, I, since I'm 18 years old, I'm collecting their CDs. Mm. Collegium Vocale Hint is another one. You listen to Collegium Vocale Hint with, with Bach, you're just like, the, it's them. Yeah. You, you, you. So it's an interesting story. The back the backstory is very interesting. I'd like to hear your experiences on this, because in fact, it's all been sort of by accident until the point at which you realize, well, this, this is who we are. And this is, is it a brand? Is it the brand that you feel that you have to, terrible word, but that you have to cherish and, and, and... Yeah, I think you don't realize you become a brand. It's people that make you realize. Um, I basically do not care much about it as long as I get concerts. That might be a bit rough what I'm saying, but it's really the truth. I don't think we wake up in the morning to think, let's keep our brands. What we think is, let's keep, let's keep our ensemble let's keep the people and what makes us special the sound the singers the, the players etc and i think that the brand the brand stays the brand uh I, maybe having a tall leader that looks like a basketball player maybe is part of the brand when you go on stage that's, ah, the tall dude is there but that's, that's why people book you Leonel. no no but yeah. but people say ah we never forget you there is always this guy that is like three heads taller than anybody else on stage yeah that's also what well, made us know? Well, sure. yeah. how, how important is any of this stuff for, totally your, for your, your feeling of identity? Tell it's us. totally important. I, I, I totally reflect on, on everything. And I, I would actually share that the sound is pr probably one a key aspect of our identity. Um, also, in, in, in 99, we decided that we cannot be called Gaudeamus Chamber Choir anymore if we're 
doing the popular music and, and jazz music. Uh, with know. microphones. Uh, with mic with yeah. microphones, yeah. We started with microphones then. So we, we went out uh, with a tender to, among our singers and, and collected like 50 ideas for the name. And, um, and then all, the, all that was sent to outside people to decide which name is most appealing for them. So like from six people from outside of the, of the group, we actually got the Perpetuum Jazzle chosen. Uh, so this was as regards to the beginning of building the brand from a no-name, no-name rhythmic choir uh, in Slovenia. So, um, yeah, at, at, at that time, uh, we had like two concerts per year for 100 family members uh, <laughs> maximum. Uh, in 15 years' time, we sold out two arena, arenas for 10,000 people. Yeah, that was yeah. the end uh, re re result of all the million baby step uh, building of, of the identity. In a minute, I want to talk about, yeah. okay, establishing an identity, great. And How being without a conductor also. Also, also. also. Yeah. 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 That's we with we the, don't yeah. have a conductor no, also. No, no. <laughs> okay. That's yeah. what we have in common. <laughs> Sorry, guys, if there are any conductors out there. I can see one very eminent conductor sitting there. We may have a view on this, uh, but uh, um, let, that may come up in audience uh, questions anyway. But having no conductor is not an identity. No, no, no. 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 Yes, but there are choirs that we always, I mean, you could not have thought about um, uh, for the Eric Erickson Chamber Choir. I mean, the name says it's already the Swedish Chamber Choir when Eric was conducting. It was just like that was Eric's choir, and that's why we listened to it. But um, how democratic is Zo? I and mean, what, what kind of things do you do? You have discussions and arguments and the singers about on identity issues? No, because it's not really a, a, a it's not an issue. Not an issue because mm -hmm. what I was saying. We, we accept everybody with their own identity, whether we respect everybody. Uh, uh, one of the main questions always is, do you have to be religious to uh, be a member of so gospel choir? And we always say no, but you have to respect it. So if somebody wants to say a prayer before we go on stage, you have to respect it. So for us, selecting new choir members is quite easy because we only have to uh, look at the quality we want for the choir. We don't look how, how you look or what age or whatsoever. We have certain you know, standards we want in a choir member. So when there are auditions, you see a range of different people. And uh, that's why I was talking, yeah, branding is also a new word, but if you see, I, I think our success is because um, we have searched around the world to see if there is a choir what all also look like us with all those different characters, uh, backgrounds, religions. religions. Faith, faith. Yeah. There is no, we yeah. haven't found them yet. So that's what makes us unique. And also, you talked about sound, but I will also say repertoire. You know, the mu the, the music we. We choose. We we from the beginning we we told ourselves we're not gonna sing Happy Day. It's a beautiful song. It's it's you know, and Edwin Hawkins did an amazing job. Uh, we sang it one time. It was with Whoopi Goldberg. So, <laughs> but we said from the beginning we're not gonna sing the like the in the Netherlands known mainstream gospel songs. Right. The opening a opening a can of gospel. Yeah, yeah, because there are more, you know, and, and that's that's if you are, yeah, I was thinking about building it. That's also a part of building your identity. It's what you want to what you want to show to the public. So maybe we didn't really thought about it, but my, Gordon and I, you know, we are the founders. We were really from the start, really straight of what we wanted. And, and that's we uh, did our 12th year. <laughs> So and and we stay we stick to that. So if you have about demo, democracy, I'm thinking that of course choir members also select songs. Choir members also have a say about clothing. Uh, so hmm. that's how far it goes. Hmm. But the main decisions is 
right. with us. Here's a question for all three of you, actually, which has just occurred to me. Um, to me. Does the identity issue, is it easier or more difficult without a conductor? You, you go ahead, Lima. <laughs> And this is um, not a conductor demolition session. Not at all. I'm just, I'm genuinely interested in, you know, the figurehead. There is no figurehead. The choir is its own, the ensemble is its own figurehead. I don't know if it's exactly the answer you want, but uh, even if there is no conductor or something, the, the press needs a person to talk to. And I guess that's the one you have in front for each of these ensembles. Uh, when, you know, you read something, you, you, you have a serial concert, the radio calls and say, who can, we, who can we talk to? You talk to the leader or the one that is designated to answer the, the questions. You, you, when the group has a certain size, you basically, you almost every time have a leader or responsible, you know, to, to do that. So is it easier or more difficult? Uh, I don't know. I, Talking about identity. Yeah, yeah. I think um, you, you don't wake up in the morning and you say, is this really who I am? Right? You wake up, brush your teeth, and you go your, do, do your thing. It's the same with the choir or with a, a vocal orchestra, like we call ourselves right now. Um, and it's like, it's like Lionel said, once... Uh, I mean, until you do a thing that makes you uncomfortable, you don't know that that can be presented as an opportunity. It's like suddenly realizing uh, us being on stage reading sheet music. It's so ridiculous. We are a rhythmic choir. You don't need to have sheet music. You need to present your passion, your body language, your, your uh, sound of your voice to your audience without any barriers or with, uh, with at least without um, um, as little barriers as possible. And reading sheet music, sorry, it's a barrier. And having a conductor there, it's a barrier. And we don't need a conductor because we are a rhythmic choir. We just need ry rhythmic reference. And th that's why we, uh, we started to sing on closed mics, that we started to sing on in-ear monitors so we can hear the beatboxer and, and, the, and the solo bass as the rhythmic section. That's all we need. Yeah. Of course, we can have like ballads uh, with rubato parts, and, and, but just one singer steps out, conducts that, that few uh, bars, and that's it. You don't need to have for two hours a person standing on stage Conducting you. you and, don't. Who, and who does the press speak to? Pardon? Who does the press speak to? That's Leonel's uh, question. Uh, various people. Yeah, we have more than one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, interesting. I'm here even though I'm not the manager, uh, the manager anymore, yeah. because we outsourced the role uh, two years ago. Yeah. yeah. Donna, no conductor, but you, you perform with a very charismatic pianist. Yeah, but we also perform with a live band. We yeah. also perform a cappella. When, when we attended the singing contest, the first question was, where is your, your conductor? And we were looking at each other. <laughs> where is our conductor? <laughs> so one of our singers, who is also our... Uh, uh, she does all the choreography in the choir, we told her, oh, Kelsey, just go and conduct us. And she did it really vividly, and, <laughs> and then there was a comment, she's not really a conductor, but for us, she was the conductor, because the steps uh, went to go up and high, she did it in her own way. So for us, when we need a, a conductor for a song, one of the choir members will step out and be the conductor, but we don't have standard a conductor with us, and we don't sing from sheets yeah. as well. You know, yeah, it's with something he said that made me think about something. He said the word manager. I think one of the moments we became aware of having an identity, etc., is when you gather extra people, your group becomes bigger and you bring a manager, 
actually somebody like a kind of business manager, like mm-hmm. a leader, uh, back office, in Holland. The back office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, and that's one of the questions they ask you, the leader. Or, I mean, uh, say, who are you? And a lot of time you can't answer very easily. And what they do usually when you have a new one, they say, let's do a new logo, let's do a new website, let's do so. And then you need to brand, actually, you need to brand yourself. You need to find a website, a logo that looks like you, that will be your new identity. And I realized how difficult it is. So the one who did the logo, like I need, I need to spend like three, four hours like talking just about whatever. So it's not, it's not easy, but actually she did find a, a very nice solution. But I think I just wanted to say that that's one moment we became very aware of the, of the need of an identity, actually, and that it's difficult. In fact, let's to, talk. To, let's talk. I would just I would just right. add um, uh, it can be a downside not to have a, a conductor because you don't have that one face uh, who is on the jumbo poster on the street. Mm-hmm. Oh, always when we try to uh, I don't know um, promote our, our huge concert in Ljubljana. If we want to put our faces there, it's going to be like a lot of people on, on stage. So nobody is recognizable, you know? Yeah. So it can be a downside with a visual appearance of, of, a, of, a, of a, such a big ensemble like we are. And, and we're struggling with that and we, we are still f- trying to find a solution. Maybe our name is a part of a solution. At first we were told back in the end of the 90s, why, why did you pick uh, s- such a long name, Perpetuum Jazile? Nobody will, nobody will remember that. But in the end, it, we ended up a household name uh, and, and a lot of people uh, remembers it just because it's so complicated and long. <laughs> so <laughs> We might want to talk about, if we have time, about changing identity very consciously. In fact, funnily enough, my own festival, which has 20 years gone through life as being the International Choral Biennale, has just had a major makeover, um, uh, which was a very scary process, which I think has worked, but let's not forget to talk about that if it's interesting. What I'd like to talk about a bit more now is maintaining identity, and in this sense, because, I mean, it seems to me that one of the most challenging, um, maybe terrifying aspects now about identity management is what is the, the revolution in digital technology and the, the whole online phenomenon. I mean, this is just like created uh, a whole load of fresh new challenges, hasn't it, about how on earth you stay on top of the game uh, online um, and, and, and digitally. How, have, how, how has each of you dealt with that? Mm. Or maybe it's not that difficult. I mean, but when I look at, for example, my, 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 for me, the role model, there are probably others, but the role model for me is to see how Voches 8 in, in London has just created an extraordinary support system, um, if, if, particularly through the Live from London series. I mean, they've been reaching one and a half million people in 75 countries. With, uh, in it. I mean, how, just talk to us about identity online and what is required to get that right. Budget. Budget, you say. Tell us about yeah, that. We're, n- we're not a funding choir, so we do everything from our uh, concerts, but we don't have any funding or whatsoever. So we do the bits and pieces we can do. And uh, to talk about social media, a lot of our choir members are also active. Uh, social media is done by my colleague, Gordon. We don't have a marketing manager. We don't have any managers. We don't have a back office. We don't have anything. But it's uh, it's like um, uh, a budget w- would uh, allow us to do more. But to be active on social media, it's like you have to nowadays. And um, I'm not good at it, but my colleague is. And we created a lot of following, you know, uh, on social media. But still, uh, we... If we have more budget, we can do more because we don't reach a million people or those kind of things. But how far away are you? This is a very common story. Yeah. Very few charitable organizations have can just pull down the cash they need to invest in this. 
But, how but they don't. They don't always do it. No. I'm, I'm surprised. I know a lot of choirs who are funded, and if I look at their social media, I'm thinking, okay, there's not really something going on. But we have to sell tickets to have our income. We sell tickets through only social media. We don't have the budget to to uh, 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 have a lot of posters through cities or whatever. So the ticket sales comes from our social media, but. Uh, I know a lot of yes choirs who are funded and their social media is non-active because they have the funding, so they don't need the tickets to have their income. Not to be, you yeah, know, it's like. Uh, it's at this point. It's at this point where I really wish we had one of those choirs at the table. I mean, we do. No, have, no to just. We, we have a representative of a choir. No, but just to say where where I'm coming yeah, from. from yeah. Uh, for us, it's really essential, and it's essential. Is it a lifeline? Is it it's a lifeline because, uh, uh, and and I can say we're pretty good at it because most of our concerts are sold out. Right. So uh, and we, we need them also to be uh, sold out. So, so it's not. I mean, you miss budgets to be able to perhaps do more than you want, but it's actually it's not resulting in underperforming on in digitally at all. No, no, no. But but you would always also when I came walking from from the car parking, I saw all the leading voices, and you know, and we, I would like to have that you know for one of our yeah. projects or whatsoever. Yeah. So it's it's um, for now it's okay, but I think you you uh, you need. Um, um, next to budget, you over also need the right people to do that for you. Okay. Because social media or, or branding is something. Yeah. Something. But else. you're getting those skills from your own, from, from the own, from your own organization. We're like cowboys. We yeah. just do. Just do, do, do what we're at. <laughs> Leonel, Vox um, Luminis Online. Tell us about that. We also have nobody to take care of it. So the Facebook has been for 14 years, I think now. Me. Um, <laughs> So some people have told me now I need to change phone to have better pictures because I even take the pictures. No, no, more, it's true. More seriously, it's I followed intuition and uh, people found out it was really us behind our um, our social media. And that got us a lot of attention. And uh, even before Facebook, it was YouTube for us. That was the, big, the first breakthrough. Uh, one of our singer had uh, this little Zoom machine and for fun was sometimes putting the Zoom during rehearsal. And we started, we were maybe the first ensemble, one of the first to put a rough rehearsal full tracks just during a rehearsal. And sometimes he was listening at home, hey, Lionel, what do you think of this one? Sounds good, no? And then we posted the uh, Nav de Bouet, for example, of Josquin des Prés, and then Alex Ross of the New Yorker suddenly posted it. And then we got messages from USA. Do you realize who just posted your video? I have to confess, at that time, I had not read The Rest is Noise, which is his big book. I did read it after, and I was like, come on, <laughs> he, did, he did me a favor. So this is how it happened. Facebook went on. Um, we tried even a PR for three months. Which, a paid, sorry, a PR? PR, 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 PR uh, person, marketing, person, yeah. uh, which divided by three the amount of response, because they realized that uh, it was not us anymore. There was no mistake in English. As a good French, I do mistake all the time. That's how they found out. But they helped us. You, you know, we did one thing was, uh, they said, you need to do a recording of, uh, of your encore of If You Love Me by Thomas Tallis. This is one of the favorite pieces. And send it to Classic FM. And then out of usually having 1,000 people listening our videos, 2,000, we got 1 million just for that piece. I mean, it's, so you know, it's like we got an advice and then people say like, yeah, you've done this now, go back to yourself. So what has worked very well for us, they never know when we will do a post. Yeah. It has shown these limits now. So for example, for the last month, I didn't post a single thing because I was on holidays and I had enough of social media. That's going too far, so we are gonna take care. But um, I think my advice would be, if people find you are really yourself or they recognize you on your social media, you might build something. For me, it has allowed us maybe to grow a bit our audience, but what has been more important to social media is actually to keep contact with your audience. It's, it's, that's maybe uh, the one thing. So. Just, just, for to, just before going to Paul Chan on this, is there any moment where 
you know, the thrill of having a million hits or anything like that has made you think, hmm, we need to develop a program even that would somehow appeal to an audience like that? Has that ever come up? No. And I know it's weird. Uh, I just I just can't bother. It's really terrible. And, and, and What's terrible? That actually I don't bother about that. I'm doing my thing. It, it's, and <laughs> I can be terrible for my manager. Sometimes says, come on, yeah. We need to do new pictures. You need to do a picture of yourself. You haven't done one for 10 years. It's, oh, come on. No, 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 no. So I'm, I'm really, I mean, I'm that, I'm saying people come to listen to my music, etc. And then I see other group and I say, oh, they do so well. I should do the same. And then I'm going back home. I said, I don't want to do that. I would be forced to do it. And actually what's funny is once you put me in front of a microphone at the radio, you put me to do a video, I have something to say. But I'm... Yeah, I don't feel uh, obsessed by that. Maybe because my generation still has known, we started, we didn't have smartphones. Yeah. And for me, the appearance of smartphone has been rather a disturbance for rehearsal than actually a gain of uh, thing. You know what I mean? I have a love and hate relation with that machine. It's like you have people hiding their, their phone in their folder. This is what we... So I rather send less information. So, but they are still checking their phone. So they are checking something else than what us. What we're hearing from you, what we're hearing from you too, actually, is that you could say, despite the enormous increase in range and reach that new technologies are giving you, it's not really affecting the core identity of of what you do. But, but what is the core core? Uh, Identity. I, I, I'm not sure if I'm thinking in identity. So, so I, I think it's it's. I, I I found it a little bit difficult. I see a choir. I like the music, or I don't like the music. I, I'm I'm not really for me then. But I'm a black woman raised in the Netherlands, so I have to, I had to fight for my own identity. So maybe it's different for me. Mm. But when we started the choir, we were sure on one thing. It's gonna be a place where everybody is seen. So I don't know if that's an identity or is it a business choice? I think. I don't know. I, mean, I think what I was driving at, of course. I mean, we, we can't have lots of sleepless nights, uh, you know, be staying awake about identity. But you know, Henry, Henry Moore. I always love this. You know, after. All these years of being this great sculptor, sculptor Henry. Somebody once said to Henry, "What's the essence? What's the essence of your work?" I mean, what a question to ask. And he said, "Truth to material. Truth to material. In other words, I don't know, but whatever I, the essence of what I do, it comes from the material with which I work, and there's a sense of truth. There's a, there's a kind of center to what we're doing. I mean." I mean, whatever, whatever Zoe is doing, there is an absolute center of truth to the sound and to what those singers yes, are doing. Yes, for sure, for sure. But um, maybe it's difficult for me to explain. Mm. It's just what we chose not to do, mm. and not we we didn't want to be like when you say uh, gospel choir. They think about the ropes yeah. and church, and and that's what. Mm. If you talk about identity, we didn't want that identity. Okay. That's that's. Plus, what plus, yeah, now I want to say, just hear from you on the whole digital question, <laughs> online <laughs> online question. How important is it to the identity and the the, 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 the business, let's say, of uh, of the ensemble? I think I think um, I think it's just one of the one of the channels that you present your your music to it, of course in a different format if it's if it's a concert it's 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 live acoustically if it's on television it's uh, with a through video appearance if it's a cd it's a, you know it's, it's a recording um, if it's digitally i don't know it's some other format and some other channels um, that your identity gets presented through uh, so, I think that um, 
the the thing that most affected change in in development of our vocal orchestra is uh, our decision that we are gonna uh, we're gonna uh, continue pursue and perfect uh, the rhythmic style of singing, uh, which meant at the beginning uh, we, we started with uh, with condenser microphones, so so they are from afar. Uh, and the style of music is still more similar to classical music than not. Then we, we obviously through live events and all the downsides of such a system, we decide, decided to go, uh, to go and set up a microphone system where each singer has his own or her own microphone, which, which means that they need to start singing differently. And if, they, if, if, if the rock, if a rock song should uh, uh, should sound like a rock song, you need to start to sing differently than last year. Yeah, so we started with the speech level singing, we started engaging uh, outside professionals with that, uh, with Tine Fries from Vocal Line and Posture, uh, from Mer with Meryl Martens uh, here from Holland, uh, with Peter Carlson, of course, as, as, uh, as uh, the, uh, the artistic leader. Um, a few years ago, so um, um, you know, as as uh, just a, a plain choir on stage, you diff it is much more difficult to to um, to project sound in in so diverse ways and in with so um, um, with so uh, uh, precise detail as you are singing uh, compared to singing uh, to a, a close a close uh, microphone yeah. Uh, so yeah Lionel then I'm going to go out to the public and ask for questions or comments from any of you a, a very short remark yeah, uh, go ahead a funny thing that I heard once something somebody came to me I mean, a couple of people actually said ah we understood your marketing now it's to be not marketing to do no marketing and I remember that moment and I just went like this with my head like oh my god I just have never thought about that None of it. and I was like okay well if that works and maybe I did it then on purpose for a while no no you know what I mean it works for some organizations yeah. but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's I think to finish one thing about our identity I realized one thing is that people have told me is that I've been present every project since the beginning some people say it's part of identity. And what would happen so that the learned, leader, the leader is always there, except when I had a laryngitis. I was happen, in the audience. What would happen if you left the ensemble? Good question. Um, some people think it would collapse. Uh, less people think it would continue. Um, I think there would be another anarchy, uh, as I talked at the beginning. Um, I think it could continue. Uh, I personally have no um, will or wish. Um, if I would die tomorrow, I think they, they would have to decide if they want to go on. And they'd argue about what they sang at your funeral, the shoots or whatever it might be. <laughs> yeah, well, the problem is we have been singing all the time requiems, so that would be a lot of choice. Well, so they're ready. They're yeah, ready. yeah, they're ready. <laughs> just, just, just adding one thing, uh, which Lionel said and made, made me remember. Uh, the, the biggest uh, PR of, of, of Perpetuum Gesile was the song Africa. Yes. That's which we signature. never which we never intended to publish <laughs> yeah and it was just by an accident but but uh, at that time i wake up i woke up in the morning receiving uh, an email from david page from toto yeah. that he would never have thought that his song would uh, uh, come out in such a magical form as we did and it was really a crappy pitch and ah uh, I would never, you know, from this uh, absolutistic uh, uh, musical point of view, would have published, you know. Uh, but it resulted in in, in Perpetuum Jazzle being on stage together with the group, with Toto, yeah. with one of the biggest rock groups ever. Yeah. You know? yeah. So, so unintended. That, yeah, the happy accident. Yeah. Let's go out to the uh, audience now and see whether there are any 
uh, questions or comments. I am, but when we end the session, I'm going to ask you to re respond to the same question. And it's even it, we, we are here to discuss how to build an identity with your choir, and I just want each of you to give us the take-home message, take-home message, a sentence, what the most important thing is for people to have in their minds on this issue, even though you think, don't worry about it, just do what you want to do, I don't care what it is, but I just want to have that take-home from, from each of you. Who would like to ask a question or make a comment on any of the discussion so far? We have a microphone somewhere. Let me just do this. I've been getting straight to instructions to use this. Thank you very much. Can I have some for the uh, online at the moment? But you yeah. have yeah. one with um, I find it is fascinating because for the years is that brand or identity. It's been an organic process rather than a structured plan. Um, and having been part of an organization that when I joined it through a restructuring process and some people took the decision to invest in a branding company and they didn't consult, they didn't hear what we did, they didn't look what we did, they, they knew nothing about us and nothing about it worked. And still to this day, we have quite comedic um, sort of reminders of that time. Um, and how we did absolutely the wrong thing in how we did it. Um, so it's actually very reassuring and encouraging to hear that um, some of the most successful just, groups... Just sum up for us now where you are in managing your own identity of Chamber Ch Ch Choir Ireland. I mean, how, how, are you good, how are you doing? I'm not sure. I, I'm, I'm actually not sure because I, I don't believe the structured approach is the right approach for us. Um, we very much have a conductor and we have a very big name as a conductor. So um, that, that goes part and parcel and, and very often internationally people don't want to know us unless Paul is travelling with us. Um, you know, so Paul that, Hillier. Paul Hillier. So that, so that is an interesting concept that we, you know, we, people don't know us but they know Paul. Um, they, and they trust Paul. So, you know, if, if, if Paul's bringing us, we, we must be fine. Um, and that's an important next step for us. Um, as to ensure that our brand develops independently of Paul, with Paul and independently of Paul as well. So, and, and we work with guest conductors, so it's not always Paul. So it's very different to, to your situation, Lionel. Yeah, well, we, we will bring guest conductors, but I'm not going to tell who. <laughs> <laughs> is this idea been born right now or is recently? Thank you, Magella. Do you want to respond to this? I mean, basically what Magella's doing is just like, endorsing a lot of what you've been saying. And yeah, and I will confirm because I know your CDs, but I trusted and I listened to them because of Paul. Here they are. <laughs> Sorry. Then I found out about the ensemble, etc. But yeah. Who else would like to... Who else would like to say anything? I could... I'm thinking of picking on someone, actually, because we have in the audience Wilma Ten Boulder, who is a, an extremely distinguished uh, conductor of children's choirs and young people's choirs. I mean, the scene in the Netherlands would not be the same without Wilma and her colleagues. Wilma, I'm just going to ask you a general question. What do you make of this discussion about identity? And tell us a bit about identity and the national youth choirs. Sorry to pick on you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, for, for me, the, the a very important part of the work is to develop the singers and to so to let them flourish and to uh, to learn music and to le to learn to sing and um, to learn to love uh, music making uh, in the ensemble. And so I like very much that there is no not a branding or something, but I've always felt that I'm just doing the job. And and I remember years ago that we um, got an invitation from the Berlin Philharmonic. Orchestra uh, to do the, uh, the, the the Berlin Philharmonic just, yeah, yeah, from yeah. Simon. From, yeah, from yeah Simon. Simon Simon Rettel, yeah, the, um, with uh, the Das Floß der Medusa from Hans Werner Henze, and um, yeah, I, I was thinking, oh, I, I got an email, oh, oh, oh my. It should be green. Just press the button. Uh, so I.
Sorry. Maybe the battery's gone. Yeah. Okay. All right. Hey, if I do it in this way and I do this so far and uh, I make a program for it, then I think we can sing it in, in eight weeks because we were invited very late in the season. And um, so, but finally I thought it is a present that it is on, on our way and it's a present. That we can do this, and so yeah, that's that's the way I uh, rework or I work with the team. Thank you. Who else comment or a question before we? For some reason, uh, this session uh, is uh, seventy minutes long, not sixty minutes long. So we do have. Uh, can I can I just uh, respond to? Um your comment about the, um, the structured work. Um, uh, not having, uh, not having a, a conductor does not mean that we don't have artistic leaders. Yeah, uh, it's just that uh, with Pieter Carlson, who was the last artistic leader of Perpetuum Gesile, uh, we, he actually initiated and we developed a, of, of uh, establishing uh, an artistic uh, leaders board, uh, so a, a team of four people who actually specialized in, in various aspects of, of our work that comes together as the thing that is seen on stage. So, for example, we have one person uh, focusing on, on concerts, on programming, on, on you know, all this stuff about the, the artistic um, presenting of the group uh, to the outside world. The other one is focusing on rehearsals, on, on as various aspects of, of rehearsals, how, how they, they are done and how the singers develop and, and everything. Then the third person is focusing on choreography and she's she, everybody of, from this board, of course, is uh, also a singer. Uh, and the third, third person uh, is a former professional dancer and she focuses on, on choreography, on choreography design on execution, uh, on stage presence, which is also very important on stage. Uh, and the, f the fourth one is uh, who is um, also a very good actor. She's focusing on, on uh, expression and interpretation of songs uh, and who is also doing the organizing between the four. Um, so we have a, a, a very uh, strong um, collective body uh, running the artistic aspect of our work and development. Okay. Anyone else out there? Okay. Let's let's wrap up then. It's it's far too sunny to be sitting inside, and of course, the beauty of this event is that lots of these people are just floating around, so you get a chance to have a one-on-one -on -one with them. So take advantage of that. Um, yeah, your take-home, the the take-home uh, message of any for, for our audience on the question of this identity question? Um, I would say um, work on your product. I'm, uh, my, my background is, is, is business and uh, economics, so I would say, <laughs> I would say uh, bluntly your product, your, <laughs> so your music. Uh, and uh, if, you get your, uh, if you get your music and your, uh, your, uh, the whole package around that, uh, identity will come with it, and um, hmm. also the also the push towards the outer world will come along sooner or later. Passion. If I would have to say one word, it's passion. Idea. Goal. And then. Almost the same implication. If you get that right, then, then identity, identity cannot be a problem. Is there? Yeah. N and never forget why you had. Uh, never forget your passion, yeah. and never forget your initial idea. Maybe. Donna. Um, stay true to yourself, and dare to think out of the box. Okay. Now, I would say it was worth coming to this session just to hear those three sound bites, um, <laughs> because I think, you know, I said this wasn't rocket science, and it's not rocket science. It's one of these things that the essence of what we're talking about here 
get the art right, the identity will follow. What's the problem? It's the easiest thing to say, and you can spend a whole career doing it. I think that's the, the, it's the that's what we're, we're all. I'm, I'm French. I never want to stop talking. <laughs> One thing to remember is, don't get too much influenced by what you see actually online, etc. Yeah. You might actually forget how many years there were before. Yeah. How much? It seems so easy because sometimes you see one or two groups that you didn't know. And then suddenly they seem to flourish. You think, they think, oh, you just need good idea, good contact, a bit of money, and then in one year you are there. Yeah. It's not true. No, no way. No Leonel, way. thank you so much. Um, I want to thank you also. You see, you. you did take the right decision coming here for this hour. Um, we've heard some um, very, very wise and inspiring words from the panel. And thank you so much for your um, presence and your patience. And please, a warm round of applause for our panellists. Thank you. Thank you so much. Many thanks for you. And do stay in touch. <laughs> yes. We are all over LinkedIn and stuff. So, yeah. yeah.